so our seventh speaker of the day is uh, Dr. Ann Diamond. Um, and she's going to highlight a question that nearly every student asks themselves at one point or another throughout their academic journey. And I'm kind of excited to see how she navigates this common question. Um, so um, Anne Diamond received her PhD in 2000 from Queen's University and shortly afterwards moved to Lethbridge to begin teaching art history and museum studies here. Uh, her research considers the use of art, museums and visual culture in the creation of cultural identity. Her book, Diversity Counts, Gender, Race and Representation in Canadian Art Galleries, uh, was published in 2019 by McGill Queen's University Press and has been described as an impressive and sobering analysis of gender and diversity in contemporary art and a compelling call for more inclusive curating. Uh, she's currently a Board of Governors Teaching Chair, our second one to present today. Uh, and last year, Anne was awarded the University Senate Volunteer Award uh, and the Lethbridge YWCA's Woman of Distinction Award for her work with refugees. Uh, she currently sits on the board at United Way of Lethbridge. So Anne's topic today is, is it too late to switch my major uh, or how or how I have learned to live with doubt. Uh, with that said, Anne, please take the floor. All right. Hi. Um, okay. Uh, I feel a little bit like um, I know students feel when they're asked to do group work and they're the seventh group that's presenting and you really want to say, all the people who went before me stole the good answers. Um, but I will do my best in any case. So thank you uh, for that generous introduction. Um, and hello, Oki. Uh, as someone living in and benefiting from Blackfoot Confederacy territory, I want to begin by honoring the traditions of people who have cared for this land since time immemorial and to thank you for your hospitality. When I was asked to do this, I was, now I know I should say honored, but in truth, I was terrified. As the international events of the last week have unfolded, I became increasingly concerned about what I could possibly have to offer in these difficult times. I watched that famous last lecture about how you can fulfill your childhood dreams and it was inspiring and motivational. And I know myself well enough to know two things. First, sunny optimism is not my jam. And second, I'm pretty crap at being phony and an easy, feel-good story about how this job is the fulfillment of my childhood dreams and how your story is going to be at even better go get them pronghorns. That's just not me, especially this week and these last few months, because these are uncertain times and I expect most of us have been experiencing some pretty negative emotions, fear, frustration, anger at the global forces that have shaped this moment and the doubt and uncertainty these things bring. But even if this wasn't the worst week in the worst few months I've seen, because I am honest to a fault, and it is a fault, I still would have been terrified because I know these talks are supposed to start with the idea of fulfilling your childhood dreams, and I know I would have to tell you straight up, I think that's basically crap. Most of our childhood dreams are, well, what's the word? Childish. So when I was asked to speak here, my first thought was, and you might be agreeing with me by now, I am not a good motivational speaker. I'm like the opposite. I'm the demotivational speaker. But, and there is a but. For me, real hope comes from acknowledging the difficult feelings and learning to do meaningful things anyways. And I have had a lot of help in learning to do that, not least from students. I am an art historian and somewhat to my surprise, I find much joy in this job, in this place, in my family, and in my activist works. But if you had told me that this would be my childhood dream, that, that this was my childhood dream, um, that, that um, I would have, even if you had told me when I am where you graduates are now, I would have scoffed. I could not have imagined that not least because I didn't even know art historian was a thing until I was in about my fourth year of undergrad. Undergrad took me quite a while, but that's a story for another day. And I certainly never imagined that I would love living in Lethbridge since, until I applied for the job here, I also didn't know it was a thing. And I had my kids late because I didn't really imagine myself as a mom, and until I was well into my 40s, I never imagined myself as an activist. So my first point is, obviously, I have a pathetically bad imagination. 
but my bigger point here is that our imaginations are limited by what we know, by what we think are the horizons of possibility. You can only imagine the careers you've heard of, and I know now, as I live what I didn't even know was my dream, that your life can take you down paths you cannot imagine. So point two, out of all the possible futures that will continue to open up before you, the most important thing is to be open to the possibilities. And as I nag my kid, to make my kids, to make good choices. And that's point three. I started undergrad as a biochem major, and I really only took art history because somebody told me it was an easy A, which is pretty true, by the way, if you're coming back to upgrade anything. Um, and this career choice of art historian demonstrates my fourth point, make some bad choices. There's no doubt in any rational decision-making system, biochem or pre-med is a better choice than art historian. But I made that rationally bad choice and it turned out all right. You will sometimes have to make choices that defy logic. You'll have to follow what your heart and the rest of your body tells you. When your stomach and your heart tell you to take a chance, sometimes you will have to leap into the unknown, the formerly unimaginable and you will find yourself with a new horizon of possibilities. Point five, and this one is key. At your core, you have some truths and your job, your real job is to come to know those. And point six, this will be a lot easier if you find people who support you. In terms of our childish dreams, I do believe they matter but I don't believe the specifics of those dreams matter. Whether you wanted to be a firefighter or like me, you wanted to be Yeoman Janice on the original Star Trek and serve Captain Kirk coffee, what matters is the values that those specifics represent, those core values, your core truths, because these stay with you from when you're a child until you're old. For me, exploring how the world thinks, thinking about fairness, has always been a core value. Some of what's central to me is what drove me to academia and to spend my life in education. I really believe in liberal education, in a well-rounded, thoughtful approach to the world that appreciates and understands the sciences, the humanities, and the arts. And so what seemed like failure in undergrad when I switched my major a hundred times is in fact part of my core. Uh, and through my education, through my research as a historian, I've learned some things that give me comfort now. I study 19th century France in what we call the long 19th century, beginning with the French Revolution of 1789. France went through five revolutions, major revolutions, in less than 100 years. I feel now that we may be in a revolutionary moment, and this is a little scary, I'm not going to lie. I know that revolutions are painful. They often go off course and sometimes they get hijacked. But historical distance shows me that the longer course of human history moves towards the greater good. It's true, we have a ways to go and denying that is damaging. But my research makes me know that times of tumult are inevitable, they're necessary, and our only choice is to act, to do in these times. My work here on this campus with so many of you students also makes me sure that the world is actually getting better and that this generation is going to take up this most important work and continue to make the world a better place. How do I know this? Because each and every one of you graduating students has been a part of this already, whether you know it or not. In 2015, as the fall term started, which might have been your last year of high school or your first or second year of undergrad, if you're like me, um, like many of you, I was galvanized that September by a picture of the lifeless body of Alain Curdy, the toddler who washed up on the shores of the Mediterranean. Rather strangely, I'm not going to talk much about art today, but if you ever doubt the power of images, this picture should allay that. This was part of the worst human crisis since World War II, but the image functioned to turn a huge, distant, unsolvable problem into something where we saw, felt, and valued the humanity of others. And I was walking around saying, the U of L is a community and communities are doing things to help refugees. 
somebody should do something. And relatively late in my life, I came to really understand one of the most important lessons, that there is no somebody to do things unless that somebody is me and you. The change we wanna see in the world is not the change that's gonna come unless we act in terms of community, unless we act as a civil society, unless we act as global citizens. And this idea of global citizenship is in fact one of the university's foundational pillars. Now, I was never a group projects kind of girl, but in a series of projects related to refugees, I learned what I could not have imagined, that I could be a conduit for other people's good wishes, for their desires for good, and that with others, we can magnify and amplify those impulses. Group work, there's a reason profs assign it. Another life lesson, we're stronger together. In that first year, the university community ended up being part of a larger regional coalition that has eventually sponsored five families, five refugee families, and more than 20 individuals. It could never have happened without a team of people with different skills and abilities. One of the best things to come from this relates to all of you as graduates, but especially those students who started the campus World University Service of Canada or WUSC Club. WUSC is part of a national organization of students who work for a better world. WUSC facilitates the sponsorship of qualified students who are also refugees to emigrate to Canada and study here. So far, you left students, you graduating students, each and every one of you have brought three amazing humans to our campus through a $2 student levy you've been paying. And here is another life lesson. Our actions don't have to be huge to make really significant change. These refugee students themselves give me much hope. I know that I can't actually imagine their lives before they arrived here. I guess we all know that since my crappy imagination seems to be emerging as a minor theme in this talk. Um, so I can't imagine what it's like to have had my grandparents displaced by genocide so that ge several generations of my family have been forced through no fault of theirs to live in a refugee camp. Nor, I'll add, can I imagine what similar circumstances uh, that devastated this territory would be like. And I can't imagine what it would be like to come from somewhere that was a functioning civil society where I worked towards my hopes and dreams only to see those literally blown up, shattered by war. I can't imagine being from a place where my whole life the future had always looked pretty bleak, nor one where it had looked promising, but I had to slowly watch those hopes drain away as my city got destroyed by bombs. I can't imagine, but I have been lucky enough to witness what it's like to see a young person arrive alone in a brand new country, to see them figure out a million differences, to see the same things all first year students um, have to figure out, which is a joy of this job to watch students learn. Remember your first weeks on campus? Um, but add in the case of these refugee students, some pretty difficult things like figuring out how to live halfway around the world, having left behind all your family and friends. Watching people who take those giant leaps and land and thrive lets me see people adapt their dreams to the here and now, to reshape those childhood dreams in accordance with their core values, which guide them to their real paths. I've also had the pleasure of watching the students who formed the club and who've been active in the club these last five years, um, including some who are graduating this year. And here I want to give a shout out to Elise, Christine, Jamie, Kira, Charette, and Kate. I read something yesterday uh, that I realized I had learned from these students, from working with students. It said, and I'll quote, that education is a radical act of hope. Education is an assertion of faith in a better future in an increasingly uncertain and fraught present. It is commitment to the future, even if we can't clearly discern the future's shape. Now, you've undertaken certain kinds of learning here in the university, you students, and you will need to carry that education forward, that self-education. You'll need to find ways to continue to learn um, because our educations must be a lifelong endeavor. 
And something else I've learned uh, through your sponsorship of ref refugee students, it's through turning hope into concrete actions that our learning has meaning. It is our actions that lead to a better future for us and our fellow human beings. And this actually changed my research, but that's a story for another day. I think it's important for me to admit something here because I know that it's significant for a lot of the students I connect with. When this all started, I really didn't know if I could do it, if I was the right person. And I've had that doubt many times in my life. In many ways, although I know it doesn't always appear that way, I am not a very confident person. I was worried in the refugee project that I might fail at something that really mattered, that it would be devastating because it mattered so much. Because this leads me to another lesson I've had to be taught again and again, and that is to accept the self-doubt, but do not let it stop you. When you feel that avoidance, that fear, that desire to run and not face something, that is your body telling you that it is something important, often something you really want, and that you have to take that leap. In order to live the greater values behind your childhood dreams, you need to work in community, in society, as a global citizen. To do this, you need to gather around you people who help you to be your best, who support you, <clears throat> who hold you up when you need that, and whose example helps you make good choices. So by far the most important choice most of us make in our life is whether we'll partner with someone, and if so, who. And I know for certain that my partner was the most important decision I ever made and the best one. Uh, the truly life-affirming benefits of that choice have shaped the contours of my life and for better or for worse, that decision will shape yours too. Although if need be, you can change it. Not least in my case, because of our great kids who make me so proud. <clears throat> like the Wuss kids, which I sort of think of as my own too. Um, because thinking consciously and critically about what I wanted to model for our kids, the person I wanted them to see, has been an important way for me to move past doubt to positive action. So life lesson, choose someone who lifts you up and do your best to lift them too. So what I've tried to he say here is that doubt properly managed can be a good thing. It gives you pause and it gives you a chance to reflect. And this lets you check whether the life you're living is in congruence with your core values, with your real childhood dreams. For me and for the hundreds of students I saw downtown at a rally for Black Lives Matter yesterday, for the thousands of people there, these core values center around recognizing and celebrating our shared humanity. I was struck by some words I read yesterday from the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda, who calls us to recognize, and I quote, all paths lead to the same goal, to convey to others what we are. And we must pass through solitude and difficulty in order to reach, to reach forth to that enchanted place where we can dance our clumsy dance and sing our sorrowful songs. But in this dance or in these songs uh, are fulfilled the most ancient rights of our conscience in the awareness of being human and of believing in our common destiny. If we've learned anything from COVID, it is that our destinies are tied together. Our learning, our education, the paths those things open up for us are part of the global condition. And now I wanna end by celebrating what brings us together today. What we share, what we have in common in this particular circumstance is most obviously the graduates of the class of 2020. And so I say to you, you have all already proven yourselves to be adaptable and resilient to get things done. And I urge you to hold that knowledge, the confidence that comes from recognizing what you've already accomplished Hold that close to your hearts in the coming days, and it will give us all the hope we need. Thank you. I'm sure there's like an applause, like we all do at the webinar, everybody does have a camera, but a wonderful lecture, and thank you for the wise words of wisdom. Um, <clears throat> like I've kind of been, as everyone gives their lectures, summarizing in my own head what I'm taking from it, and you know, for me, yeah, the, the whole idea of, you know, being open to the fact that, you know, and, and I think this is what I, I took and hopefully the students got the same thing is that I loved your theme of imagination is only what you currently know. So you have to be open to the idea that you're going to learn things you don't know that will 
move you forward in life and, and not to be afraid to take that leap. The other thing that really resonated with me is that uh, you, you emphasized to, to them uh, that, you know, no matter how confident you may come across, and, and I'm sure this is the case for most of the professors and instructors at the university, the students view us as this sort of bank of knowledge and these, these really confident people. Um, but what they don't really realize is we're just humans like they are. And at some point we were in the exact same seat they were. And even we doubt ourselves too. So that really, really you know, resonated with me. It's something that I try to teach my students all the time too, that, you know, we were once where you were and we're still there. Uh, you, we may not show it, but we're still there. We're still doubting yeah. ourselves every day sometimes. Um, so we did have a few questions for you from the audience. So um, Abed Moosley asks, um, you probably know Abed, um, in a bleak political and social atmosphere, where do you get the hope and positive energy to continue acting for change? Yeah. I mean, definitely that the, the will to act is really challenging right now, I think. I think, um, I mean, I've been reading about it, that it's not just me that since this COVID isolation um, has happened, many of us uh, have felt um, unable to act, right? It, um, uh, and I think that is really a challenge. What has, one of the things that has helped me is um, reading the science of that. Like that's actually a kind of trauma response and our bodies respond by, you know, shutting down and not being able to work as well. So maybe that goes back to the kind of um, integrated set of learning that is important to me. Like the science relates to my emotions, which helps me understand my actions. And those things together are make me able to sort of overcome the science of it, if you see what I mean. Like I can kind of go, okay, I recognize that shutting down is not going to achieve the goals I want. And making those things conscious is really important for me. I say that, like, the idea that, um, I mean, I think Robin touched on it a lot too, that being sort of honest with yourself and listening to yourself and thinking, okay, is this, sure, this is what I'm doing, but is the, is the action valid? I, I have to act in the end. So... I don't know if that answers the question, but I think it's... I think you did a great job with it. Um, Jess Farah just had a message to pass on to you that, you know, all of our destinies are tied together. And thank you for this message of hope and, and how lucky we are to have you in our community. Thanks, Jess. Um, I, I mean, I, I have, like, the I, I do tend to have to look for the positive. I don't think I naturally see everything. I'm not a glass half full or whatever that expression is kind of person. I think I tend towards the negative, but... Um, I think I might have trained myself to look for the positive, which relates to Jess's comment and to the earlier one, um, because I can, I can see the positive in this COVID that I think maybe a lot of us didn't really understand how global our world was until this happened. And now we absolutely have to understand the world as global, right? There's no going back from that. So I had a, an interesting question um, for you. Um, you know, obviously your, your background is art history. Um, and and at, throughout this change and these leaps you're taking in your development where you are now, you, you've you've gotten yourself you're, you're still obviously in our history, but you've also now got yourself in this world of you know social justice and, and refugees, um, and it doesn't seem like they're really too interconnected. Um, so can you is is there a way in which they're interconnected or are they tied together? Yeah, I mean in some ways I think art history like that's the um, major I ended up landing on, uh, and doing two subsequent degrees in. So like, obviously it suits me, but really um, I could have ended up in many different disciplines in academia and that would have been right for me. Academia is the right place for me. Um, uh, but yeah, art history um, as one, as a student recently joked, not joked, a student recently said to me, oh, that's like the most white girl discipline. Like it doesn't fit with social justice, right? <laughs> and that is actually not true. <laughs> Art, like art history used to be that I will I agree um, but artistry is really trying it's a way of understanding the world through the things people make and the things people do over time um, and it is I think really now um, much more concerned with like sort of the, um, the discipline has moved to thinking about how the discipline itself has had really negative effects globally and prioritize one culture European over other cultures um, and I think actually thinking through that in terms of the discipline of art history and its negative effects in the world actually moved me to the place of social justice. That isn't really where I started, but the discipline actually helped me get there. Um, 
Yes. Yeah, I, I, I was, I was interesting to me because it, you know, much like Dawn's talk about uh, indigenous art and storytelling, it's the same thing here, right? Because as art history, your, your, your expertise is to look at these historical pieces of work that that tell a story and their way of telling a story, right? And learning from them and use the example in, in um, revolutionary France, I believe, right? Where, you know, you could tell the stories they were telling through their painting of the situations that they were going through at the time. So I thought it was really interesting. Um, I have a more light question here, and it, it's 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 not to make light of the topic at all, but it came from Shannon Spensley, and it's only because you made reference to your real aspiration in life of being a Star Trek character serving uh, James Kirk coffee. So she asked, uh, because also for the people in the audience who don't know this, we did a practice rehearsal of this a few days ago. We noticed in Shannon Spensley's office she had a Star Trek book in the background. So she asks you what your favorite Star Trek series is and why. Um. Well, I'll, I might even explain that Yeoman Janice reference a little bit because it is funny to me when I think of my work as a feminist now as uh, those horizons of possibility were pretty small when I was a kid, right? Our culture for, for women didn't um, show so many things. And Yeoman Janice, those of you who know me well will find it hard to imagine that was someone I aspired to be because all she ever did was come in and say, <gasps> Would you like a coffee, Captain Kirk? And that is not me. But anyway, um, so um, I think I have, I know it's not the best series, Shannon, but I'm an old school kind of Star Trek girl. I've watched quite a few of the series, but um, the original series, I at one point probably knew like every episode and half the lines in them. So um, yeah, I'm old school on that one. <laughs> um, so uh, you, you touched on this a bit in your talk, but it's kind of for me, um, I think it's a neat question to ask you because uh, a lot of these students out there as they go out and get jobs and start to give back and take those leaps and find the things that are part of their core values they want to give back to that you touched on. Um, so how did you get involved in, in WUSC and refugee issues and sort of how did you get there to get an idea of how you found that path for yourself, that value, that thing that you wanted to put your time into that you found real importance your call to help with? I mean, really, that photograph of that that I mentioned in the talk, that photograph of uh, um, that little boy, um, it literally changed my life. Um, and uh, I'm not a religious person. I was raised in a faith tradition, but I have, like Robin mentioned, um, found that my core values don't fit with that anymore. And um, when I saw that picture, I felt called. Um, and I ended up working with Erin Phillips, who many on this campus will know, um, who is a, a Anglican priest. Um, and that was quite a surprise to me that I would be doing that kind of work. Um, so yeah, it just felt like it had to happen. And if someone was, someone needed to do it. <laughs> and so yeah, so we, we started. And then the students, the, the student part of that piece came from actually an art history major who came into my office and said, I understand you're doing this thing about refugees, but the community that I'm from isn't really that supportive of refugees what can we do? And I knew about the national organization. I was like, okay, well, everything just fell into place. So I don't know, some things, sometimes these paths just open up and there, yeah. it doesn't make sense. You didn't have to take the leap. You were kind of just shown the leap. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Somebody shoved me from behind. Right. <laughs> but you crossed the gap and landed on the other side. <laughs> we have, yes. And it has been like truly a great, a great pleasure of my life that I never would have imagined. Well, thank you very much for that lecture, Anne. Um, it was wonderful. Um, and I know you felt like you thought you were repeating topics from earlier in the day and, you know, like that seventh presenter, but I, I think you, you hit a home run. So thank you. Okay. Very much. Well, thank you for all for organizing it. And yeah, congratulations to the grads of 2020. Um, it's uncertain and amazing times that they're entering into, but I know you, you grads will, um, will find your way. <laughs>